read out of the titles, but we're now having the unexpurgated version. <laughs> Say this, that it's the first time I've ever been told that the title I've submitted wasn't acceptable. <laughs> one thing, one thing to be told that the content's not acceptable, but the title, but the title, <clears throat> and the, I mean, and the title I was, I was going to talk to and will actually, is around food security and food sovereignty as morbid symptoms of late capitalism, and of course the morbid symptoms comes from Gramsci. And to quote him, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. And it's those morbid symptoms which I think we can locate our understanding of food sovereignty and food um, security. The other kind of quotation I would begin with is from the late, is from the late Samir Amin, who who noted that capitalism by its nature can't resolve the peasant question. The only prospects it can offer are a planet full of slums and billions of too many, in quotes, human beings. Capitalism is becoming barbaric and leads directly to genocide. It's more than ever necessary to replace it by other development logics, which are more rational. And these are the kinds of themes, it seems to me, that people have been discussing today. And what I propose to do at least in the first hour, um, <laughs> is, 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 to raise, is to raise five questions of things that um, I thought about before today, and I don't think anything has happened in the discussion um, that has changed my mind from the five questions that I'm raising, and they're five questions about food security and food sovereignty and late capitalism, and here late is referring to the capitalism after 1975. And from that date, of course, neoliberalism and the capitalism that we know is one that has been in intense crisis and actually is, as Ali suggested this morning, in terminal decline. But how we uh, recognize or understand that uh, terminality and how we can tra perhaps try and hasten its demise is something that I think probably all of us in some way or other are um, concerned about. And what I want to also do is to try and link uh, my observations and the questions I raise in the possibility of a shift in the character of the third world food regime, a third world food regime that was ushered in in 1973 in a period that effectively since then has been marked by what we could say is the end of developmentalism. Uh, the current period is one where food sovereignty is seen as a radical alternative to food security, and I want to interrogate that um, a bit. Food sovereignty is now discussed almost as much as food security, but of course, despite that, care is still needed, partly because reformers now use the radical <laughs> rhetoric of sovereignty as an excuse to extend the food chain maximized food product diversification, especially around organic food as a proposed alternative to food security. Or alternatively, there is, of course, the much more radical food sovereignty that offers an epistemic shift from food security to capture, instead, farmer demands that effectively, under no circumstances, would you take my land and use it for anything other than that over which I make all the decisions about. That, for me, is the premise upon which radical food sovereignty um, emerges. And from that, of course, is the significance of <coughs> themes related to agroecology, social class, and social <coughs> differentiation in relation to battles against the food giants that we've been looking at in other parts of um, today. So at the outset, I suppose I want to be clear, or try and be clear, that there seems to be quite a lot of agreement on the seven principles of food sovereignty. These are principles that can be summarized in terms of affirming food as a human right, uh, the need for agrarian reform, natural resource protection, shifts in the character of the food trade, peace and democratization, and the end of global hunger. All those themes are actually the, under the umbrella of food sovereignty. The trouble is with those headings is that it's a bit like what the Americans call motherhood and apple pie. Um, you can't possibly be 
against it. The problem is that the first question really is food sovereignty in fear of being captured by neoliberalism. So that's the first question I'm posing you, really. I don't have the answers. We're going to kick these around um, together. Um, is food sovereignty in fear of being captured by um, neoliberalism? We can also offer, of course, a more radical interpretation of food sovereignty in late capitalism if we understand the temporality of capitalism. In other words, capitalism is not here to stay. And one way of understanding capitalism's temporality is, I propose, and others around this table have done the same as well, is to look at the importance of food regime analysis. Food regimes and world food systems explain how the commercialization of agriculture has spread and what some of the forms of resistance to that commercialization have been in the periphery, in the periphery of a core in Europe and North America. So a food regime is a rule-governed structure of production and consumption of food on the world scale. It's an analytical framework to, which is rooted in an historical analysis of commercial agriculture, how it's grown, who the main actors have been, how we understand that growth, and how we understand points of intervention and the promotion of resistance to it. But the importance is that we have an analytical frame within which to bundle in some of the themes that we've looked at um, today. The understanding of historical processes of the expansion of the global food system is to actually understand what the limitations are in this region in promoting an alternative to food import um, dependency. And if I had an overhead, I'd show you a fancy chart or table um, which you might be grateful I don't have the opportunity to show you because it's a table effectively to summarize world food systems analysis and different food regimes, one from 1870 to 1914, the second from the 40s until 1973, and the third from 73 until the contemporary period. But what I would, what I would have done had there been a PowerPoint would be to talk much more in more detail to this table to ask you and whether we could collectively together put a fourth column. Could we put a fourth food regime related to the contemporary period? And what would that look like? <clears throat> so, second question. Is it possible now to see a fourth food regime emerging? And what would the characteristics of that fourth food regime be? Are we in a transition to it? Are we in a process of accelerated depeasantization, for example, and the possibility for redistribution, agrarian reform, deepening and extension of social movements that are having an impact on actually rolling back the power of the corporates that we've been so critical of earlier today. So the fourth food regime is perhaps, I'm suggesting, one that's characterized by contestation around a radical food sovereignty dynamic not one seen through the prism of food as a human right, but food as part of socialist de development in the 21st century. Is it premature in, in capitalism's crisis to think through what moving from capital-centered development, which of course is a term Ben Selwyn has used very appropriately recently, can we move in this current conjecture of late capitalism, can we move from a capital-centered view of development to one orchestrated and organized around labor? And if we can, what would it look like? What would be necessary to try and promote that tipping into the fourth food regime? One centered around labor in its early formation would have to immediately address poverty. You'd have to decide how labor can be reproduced more healthily and with choices in a more democratic state? And what would be the necessary continued participation in the world food economy or the world food system that we um, might promote the jettisoning of from our newly emerging fourth food regime? Crucially, how could we more effectively produce public goods 
at affordable prices. Public goods at affordable prices. Late capitalism is characterized or underpinned by the analysis of financialization, the financialization of food and agriculture, and recent work by Jennifer Clapp and Rian uh, Isaacson on sp speculative harvests. Note how financialization now influences, of course, the way food is produced, how it's distributed, how it's consumed, and how profits are made. This is at the core of the contemporary conjuncture of late capitalism's crisis of financialization. Agriculture since 2008 especially, but before that too, but especially since 2008, is now a source of direct capital accumulation, benefiting from earlier patterns of deregulation of markets, speculation in prices, new investment projects. And these new investment projects or packages by equity finance companies like Blackstocks, for example, that, of course, they would say with some irony, <clears throat> but I think actually is just crude, have an investment portfolio called COW, C-O-W, with funds in companies like Archer Daniels, Midlands Company, Tyson's Food, and Bunge, which, of course, is one of the biggest transporters of grain across the planet. Another <coughs> equity finance company, Van Eck, has an another equity fund called Moo, M double O, and it has significant investments in potash, uh, Syngenta, and Deer. So financialization prior prioritizes, of course, shareholder value, and there's a concentration and centralization of capital in that process to control the farm sector, literally from the farm to the plate. So here, you know, forgive me for being uh, bloody obvious, as we would say in North London, Food is a highly inelastic demand. People need food to eat, but food is like every other commodity. It has an exchange value and a use value. So unless you have the wherewithal to purchase the food, you cannot purchase that commodity. Crucial here is another obvious, other obvious observation. I'm being harassed here by the only fly that's in this room. <laughs> Capitalism is, I'm assuming we agree, a historically specific and contradictory mode of production that systematically produces class inequality, crisis, and conditions for different types of <coughs> and forms of politics. So, understanding capitalism and food. I'm suggesting we need food regime or food systems frameworks as crucial in exploring development of center periphery relations. And what have become known, more popularly known in the critical literature as agrarian questions, questions of accumulation, production, and politics. <clears throat> so question three <coughs> is does agriculture in this region or any other region that you have expertise in, have the capacity to generate food and non-food output that exceeds an amount necessary for self-provisioning. Does agriculture in this region have the capacity to generate food and non-food output that exceeds the, the amount necessary for meeting self-provisioning? And if it does, what are the obstacles that prevent that from being realized. I can imagine many of you will hurl obstacles at me for even suggesting that there isn't enough capacity and wherewithal to provide surplus in excess of self-provisioning. But it clearly is not. So why isn't it? What are the obstacles for so doing? Or does actually raising that question in that way simply allow us to fall into the old productionist traps that are promoted by the bank um, and the fund. We can ask a slightly different question, namely what rural, what rural social classes benefit from social differentiation and what policy would be needed to ensure a more equal distribution and consumption of food in the context of what we've heard today of war, conflict and high levels of 
<coughs> displacement. One thing is clear, and I don't make any apology to refer to the IFIs, one thing is clear is that we cannot turn to the IFIs, the international financial institutions like the bank and the fund, for help in fathoming answers to these questions. We know, as been said already, the data in the region is very scarce for very obvious political reasons. But how do we understand the impact of and the character of agrarian capitalism in this region, the Near East and North Africa, where 60% of all farms are less than one hectare? 60% less than one hectare, more than 50% of land is owned by holdings of over 10 hectares. There are other stats that one can look at. You can question and argue about the efficacy of them. But the issue related to the inequality that they highlight relates also to the consequences for poor family farmers. Poor family farmers and landless, and also near landless, where dependence upon wages off farm becomes so important, or on other land owned by other farmers. In other words, as soon as we begin to analyze the characterization of inequality, we get into a set of social relationships that require us to explore the process of commercialization. <clears throat> Crucially, too, that level of commercial, the consequence of commercialization and the social differentiation that allows us a window into exploring it also raises political issues of the consequences of high levels of inequality. What are the networks that may or may not exist between landless and near landless and urban social classes, not only through migration and employment, but also in terms of access to food and markets linked to food production, distribution, and political alliances that can be forged for social transformation? I want to make one comment. I, I have five minutes, according to my clock, so I think I can do this reasonably well in time. I want to, <coughs> excuse me. I want to make one comment about the role of the bank. Because no matter how distasteful one may find analyzing what they do, they remain worryingly influential. The World Bank Group, in its Global Monitoring Report 2017, asserted a ridiculously low level for $1.90 poverty level for the MENA region. And that was at a level of 2.5% of the population, <coughs> which would make this region on a par with the rest of Europe scandalously stupid statistic to be publicized by any reputable um, organization. But there's an even more chilling World Bank Group report. The World Bank Group's New Economy for the Middle East and North Africa, which was published in October this year, makes absolutely no mention of farming and agriculture and certainly not of peasants. This is a, a document entitled New Economy for the Middle East and North Africa. No mention of the rural sector or the social actors involved. The new economy they talk about is an economy to empower, nevertheless, women and youth. But how are they going to do it? They're going to do it in the area of the internet and digital expansion. I have a long quote from the bank which I'll Save, I'll save all our ears from uh, repeating. E-farming. <coughs> Num? E-farming. E-farming, yeah. E -farming. yeah. yeah very good. <laughs> I think we need to reflect on the... I'm, I'm convinced we need to reflect on the persistent mission of the World Bank and of its repeated tropes regarding state inefficiency and the gains from entrepreneurialism. We can note with alarm how the bank now asserts that the region, it gets better, the region, the region must now adopt, quote, a moonshot approach to development. A moonshot approach. Why? 
because gradualist approaches to change <clears throat> are no longer feasible. The region has now got to adopt, quote, the style and the impatience of the United States <clears throat> to get a man on the moon. And to quote them, I will quote them, see, I'm going to put you through. <clears throat> Mena Moonshot can unite people behind a common goal and transform the ways in which governments, companies, international financial institutions, and civil societies conduct business. The bank assumes that a digital economy will create work, create jobs. It also concedes, though, that in the period when there was, when there was economic growth, between 2005 and 2010, the economies were precisely unable to provide employment for an enlarging uh, unemployed capital capital intensive growth in labor surplus economies. Moreover, the language that is used beyond what I've mentioned um, is also a language very much at the heart of the 1950s modernization theory. Basically, there are economies in the region that can be, quote, unlocked. It's a bit like the Arab Spring, just waiting. The, the push for democracy is just waiting to take off and be released if only it could have the help and assistance of Western um, democracy. The bank does know that the region have got problems dealing with what they see to be global mega trends. And these are trends that they think the bank will have trouble <coughs> keeping up with, in particular ideas of interconnectedness of the globalized world, cross-border trade, capital and labor mobility. But there's absolutely no mention again of two million refugees in Lebanon, one and a half million in Jordan, <coughs> more than 250,000 in Egypt. So question four, <coughs> should you decide to accept the challenge? <coughs> question four, do we care? Why should we care about what it is that the World Bank says and does? And perhaps, <clears throat> as importantly, how do we fathom the relationships between the World Bank and local political and economic elites? So two things there really is, what is it the bank saying? How and why are they saying it? With what kinds of consequences on the ground in relation to macroeconomic issues? But linked to those macroeconomic outcomes is who are their political conduits for delivering neoliberalism in this sector or any other <clears throat> sector. And should we be bothered about that? Can we afford to exclude an understanding of the bank and the fund? The silences of the bank on food security, peasant agriculture, consequences of economic reform, environmental transformation, war, all those issues that are driven by imperialism, all those issues which have been so much our concern and focus today, are of course driven by local clients. Local class actors, local states, local factions of the bourgeoisie, here and elsewhere. Sisi, now in Egypt, in, he has a lot of competition, but the most authoritarian and bestial regime in a region of authoritarianism and bestiality. Sisi is now exacting an austerity program to try and reverse an external debt almost equal to 40% of the country's GDP. And of course, it's immediately seeking to clobber that through cuts in crucial food subsidies and transport costs for the working class and um, rural poor. How long can regimes get away with that? And what is, what is it that will prevent them from getting away with it? That could be another question, but it's not one I've, it's, I, haven't, I haven't written it down, so it's not one for a discussion. <clears throat> so finally, you know, the logic of capitalism, we know, is to expand without limits, destroy human beings, and destroy nature. That was made very clear in the presentations this morning. And of course, human beings and the natural world, however one constitutes that, are the originators of wealth. And yet we live in a society, in a social formation, that destroys the creations of that wealth and distributes it according to 
political and economic power. Samir Amin said that since uh, 1975, we've been living in a period of generalized monopoly capitalism, where monopoly capital controls everything, all sectors of life, which have now been reduced to zero. And the relative autonomy of agriculture and industry are now subordinated to the gains of imperialist monopoly rent. An overstatement? Wherein lies the space and opportunity for resistance within that hegemonic force of late monopoly capitalism? For Jason Moore, the key feature of the post-75 economic crisis has been, the has been the difficulty of the capacity of capitalism to develop access to strategic inputs. And those strategic inputs, of course, are those inputs which relate to food and labor and other social and economic transformatory dynamics of late capitalism. So the fifth and final question is, oh, slightly, long, slightly more long-winded, the fifth and final question is, in the period of, imp <coughs> okay. in the, in the period of the imperialist triad, to use the late Samir Amin's uh, phrase, which I think is wonderful, the imperialist triad of the US, EU and Japan that manages the world system and dominates key areas of technology, resource access, creation and reproduction of financial systems of exploitation, dominance of the arms sector, as well as providing for support from media moguls. Wherein lies the space for resistance and the promotion of food sovereignty? I should say that one final comment. I mean, the political trick here really is not to. The, this isn't a this isn't a discussion to be optimistic or pessimistic in. It's a discussion to recognise what some of these objective forces of the crisis of late capitalism are, and what the social forces to promote a resistance and a transformation of it look like. And one of the core constituencies that we've all looked at today as a form of resistance to these morbid symptoms of late capitalism is the peasantry, are the farmers, which isn't to allow us in any way to be sentimental or romantic about rurality because anybody who has ever stepped half a foot into the countryside realized that it's not a harmonious and certainly isn't a place to uh, necessarily conjure up or recreate. It is instead to recognize that unless we grasp the importance of sustaining and reproducing and promoting support for rurality, we're all doomed. Thank you very much. So I just want to kick off the discussion by saying that I think, Ray, uh, you have to add one more question to your five questions. In fact, it's a good idea if you start with that question, and that is, what is food? Because I think food is too aggregative a category. And a part of the reason we don't get any satisfactory answers to the rest of the questions you've been, you posed, which are very important questions, is because we're working with a category which is far too aggregative. I mean, food is not just one thing. It's a number of different things. And uh, a country can have enough of one kind of food, but not enough of another. For example, if, we, if you take food grains and dairy products, then Europe and America have too much production of food grains and dairy products. But if you're talking about uh, fruit and vegetables in winter, then neither uh, North America nor Europe have enough uh, supply of that kind of food. And who would say that uh, grains and dairy products are enough for any kind of a balanced diet? So obviously, 
the rich industrial north is surplus in certain types of food, but it is grossly deficient in other types of food. And I think uh, unless we recognize this, we don't recognize the actual dynamic through which food systems, so-called food regimes, operate. We don't understand the operation of transnational food companies. We don't understand, for example, why last May, which is just a few months ago, the United States uh, took a complaint against India to the World Trade Organization, uh, making an absurd claim that, uh, look, India is giving subsidies for rice and wheat, which is far in excess of the de minimis provision of the Agreement on Agriculture, which says you can't exceed subsidies uh, to the extent of 10% uh, of the value of your production. That is, if you take the value of our wheat production or rice production, we can't get, give subsidies more than 10%. And the argument that is put forward is utterly absurd because uh, the fact that costs have risen tenfold since 1986 to 88 is ignored. And the price, international price of wheat and rice, which prevailed then, and how long ago is that? Just make a calculation, 96, more than 30 years ago. The international price which prevailed 30 years ago is then compared to India's minimum support price, and the difference is about 1,000 rupees a quintal, and that is multiplied by the whole of the output to reach an astronomical figure, and they say you're supporting, giving support to the extent of, of 60 to 70 percent of the value of your output, which is just intellectual dishonesty, but what lies behind it is uh, would be given if you pose the first the question I'm, uh, I'm posing. What they basically want is to access our market for their surplus grain. So they want India and other developing countries to give up our own food procurement and distribution system and rely on imports of grain because they have a surplus of it. So does the European Union. I don't know whether Britain specifically has or not, but the EU certainly has. On the other hand, where they have a huge deficit is all these things, uh, you know, obviously in winter you don't produce anything at all. So fresh fruit and vegetables in winter, which the transnational companies want to access from our land and from our agriculture. So, sorry, uh, my question itself became a kind of very long <laughs> digression, but I think, I do think this is very necessary if you're going to get, get it any kind of meaningful answers. You know. uh, thank you, Ray. Um, Thanks a lot. It's actually, it was a question to Habib about the fourth food regime, so I thank you for developing this point. Um, as actually, um, well, maybe populism should be inside of, you know, uh, the rise of Trump with what's happening with India, with the war of tariffs with China, with, with all this uh, protectionism coming back. So maybe populism might be um, an entry point of what power might be uh, hidden behind this uh, Fourth, uh, the opposite of what might be uh, we asking for. So, uh, well, something else is actually very important is also the SDGs. We are bombarded with SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, beside the World Bank now, it's the credo of all the civil society. Uh, we've been uh, um, in part of it. It's actually they are claiming that we want SDG, is claiming that by 2030 we want zero hunger. But if we look at it, a little bit uh, like uh, meticulously. Well, for example, the 2.3 SDG would ask for doubling the productivity of farmers, and 2.2.A would increase the investment and FDIs. So we are still in the same um, continuity of what is what's been happening since uh, the second food regime, which is the green revolution, uh, and all the interest of agribusiness that might be uh, in there. So where where do you situate this, and how can we fight? and refuse the SDGs, as simple as that. Um, something else, maybe it was your fifth question, and it reminds me a bit uh, Aragi's uh, critique of the food regime, is that we forgot to put the labor history of value inside of it. So maybe this might be an entry point. How, what do you think? Thank you, Ray. Uh, you mentioned uh, the US, EU, and Japan. And uh, since I'm from Syria, I, I just want to uh, how do you see the differentiation between uh, the shift in the power toward the East as the role of Russia and China? Uh, as in the uh, armed conflict in Syria, we can see that the role of Russia is not far away from the U.S. in supporting authoritarianism or uh, 
supporting uh, subordination of people. Uh, actually, they are uh, coordinating uh, on the regional level and on the international level, as we can see uh, during the conflict. So this is one side, which is who is the, the new power, how this created, and how you differentiate between the new emerging uh, powers. Uh, the second question is the, the role of identity politics, the cultural questions, or the way uh, that more investing in identity politics, which is complementing the uh, other materialistic approach to think about how, uh, how this af affecting the people, affecting the, the farmers, and affecting the labor uh, within the country. How do you think we have to introduce this in the framework? Uh, because we can see that there is a lot of costs uh, for supporting or investing in identity politics, like the cost for uh, war economy or conflict economy, which is producing gains for uh, chronic capitalists or some of the tyrannists. Ah, we lead to the next. <laughs> you didn't get very many of those. I mean, I th you know, thanks for the questions. Uh, thank you, Ursa, for um, clarifying effectively what is the relationship between the center and the periphery. Through, through grain, which has been at the heart of, which was certainly at the heart of US foreign policy after 45, with the use and expansion of public, for, public law 480. Sorry, pu oh, sorry. Um, I'm suggesting that effectively you, you reaffirm the significance of grain as a political weapon that was certainly used by the US after 45. And I think it's quite clear, and Chomsky has done this ad infinitum, but the State Department records after 45 show very clearly how grain will be used to establish and recreate political clients, and that the brouhaha around the former Soviet Union was precisely brouhaha, that the bigger concern that the US State Department has was for maximizing the, exert the way in which grain could be used for a political weapon and to snuff out any possibility for nationalist revolt. So nationalism was the virus that the State Department wanted to snuff out. It wasn't either the former Soviet Union or the erosion, the end of, of, of hunger. I mean, your, your comment matches, I think, thinking behind a couple of these other questions, and that is this, what we know, we know, but many others seem less clear on, and that is the nonsense that the um, World Food Summits have historically always announced. I mean, it was Henry Kissinger, Dr. Death, no less, who in 96, 96 or 92, World Food Summit, said that within 10 years, no man, woman, or child would go to bed hungry. That was the, the, the formal statement in the conclusion of the World Food Summit. And 10 years later, there's another food summit, and they're reducing down the idea or the assumption, the expectation that they can erase hunger to actually, before the, end of the, <coughs> before the end of the decade, there will only be 500 million in the planet who won't be able to have a sufficient uh, calorific in, in, intake. So there is a, I think what we have to be cautious of is, is it's very easy and it's quite, I suppose it's still important to mobilize around food as a right and the whole kind of rights agenda that international agencies are very fond of. But actually we know that analytically, the uh, food isn't, uh, we don't have rights to food, <laughs> we only have the ability to purchase it and access it through, as you suggested, the labor theory of value globally and how that's exacted between powers in the periphery um, and, at the, and at the core. Does that mean that we think it's not important that there has been a year for family farming in 2013, that the FAO, de FAO declared? and around which many important research papers were assembled, a lot of international debate and discussion took place, political and social mobilization. Does that mean that we wouldn't throw political support behind that, knowing that De Silva, who's the current head of the FAO, had enormous political um, difficulty ensuring that there could indeed be a year for family farming because the United States were unhappy with such an idea? 
and very quickly, of course, after that year of family farming, it became the year of the soil. And then uh, the United States and the agribusiness lobbyists, who are incredibly powerful within the area, uh, were very uh, helpful. I mean, I can remember being trapped in a lift with a redneck from the deep south in the US. If, if, is that allowed to say that? Is that um, who um, Rick started haranguing me. I, mean, I didn't know him from anybody, but he started haranguing me for the waste of time that the FAO was spending having a conference on the year of family farming when the only good thing to be done was to actually create conditions for investment and he was a head of a company that could help promote that and reduce hunger like that. But it was, he was an advocate for the chemicalization of food and, food, and, <laughs> food and poverty, which was precisely why De Silva put the year of family farming on the table and delivered it. But subsequently, there is now a decade. How many of us here know that? There is, we are now in a decade of family farming, just announced by the UN. What, is that important? Is that significant? Is that part of the political struggle that we engage with at the level of, of reform? And how do we see the relationship between that and other types of activism? Would we support Via, Camp Via Campesina becoming part of the advisory group within the FAO now, which is something De Silva again has very radically promoted and advocated for, or does the inclusion of a group like La Via Campesina inside the tent mean that they will be automatically depoliticized in that, in that process? I mean, these are really important, excuse me, political issues. Do we have a view on it? Is it does it matter? Would it, would it be important for them to um, opt out of that? I don't see Russia as an imperialist power. Period. That's all I have to say on that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's a bigger issue with China and the high level of liquidity and dollar, dollar um, presence because the IMF just this week has announced that they don't know exactly how much money China has lent to the Maghreb and Sub-Saharan Africa because of the secrecy deals between Beijing and bilateral lending. And yet, the IMF is now being petitioned by states in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular for new bilateral arrangements, concessional lending, rescheduling. But the IMF is doing it blind, which they really hate because they like to control all issues of what they determine as transparency. So there is an issue of the financial weight and power of China, which is slightly different from the strategic and military presence of um, the former Soviet Union in, in Syria. Just to follow up on that, since Syria is close to Rabia's heart, is it not also that uh, what you I mean, what the, the fundamental understanding of these imperial powers is that they control the world uh, financial and capital flows in a manner that uh, Russia does not. Huh? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it is not that uh, you know, one is that this implies that you are, uh, you know. Um, giving a blank check uh, for all military action done by Russia, for example. It simply means that analytically, Russia does quite absolutely does not stand uh, in this, at, the, at, the, at the pivotal um, places of control. That's why you drew a certain contrast with the scale of financial flows out of China. Um, and so I'm just, that's just a footnote to make it a bit more intelligible uh, for, yeah, I, mean, think, I'm, I, was I very, think, as to you know, what I apologize if I was about. too short in my yeah. response to your intervention by simply saying I do not think uh, Russia is an imperialist power. I don't, partly for the reasons that Martha said, but also, of course, it would go to the heart of what one understands by the... Uh, conflict in Syria and the geostrategic position that clearly Russia has as a as skin in the game compared to the uh, Washington's interest to dismantle a strong nationalist regime which is what they've 
sought to do in Syria, which they've done in Libya, and which they seek to do as part of their imperialist adventurism. Yes, so I thanks for the intervention. Um, I would ask you to elaborate a little bit, you know, we've talked about farmers and we've talked about the World Bank, but so outside of, you know, looking purely at agriculture, what could you suggest are additional kind of policy changes that go hand in hand to support farmers? So, you know, if you can give kind of broad directions. We talked about some of this in, in Tunisia, I remember, so we talked about currency exchange, we talked about central banks, we talked, and so I'm wondering if you can, you know, sprinkle some of this in, obviously it's a huge question, but directions. I mean, I think there are, and, and partly in anticipation to this kind of question, I mean, I have, I mean, there is a, there is a debate about how one can establish and promote particular pathways to food sovereignty. Um, and I suppose I'm hesitant to simply establish um, a shopping list, because the shopping list is what famously the IFIs do in what they think should be done for reform. I mean, the obvious issues are related to agrarian reform, strategies to limit landlessness, produce for, le for need, not for the market, create conditions for subsidies, create conditions and policy measures that will rein in um, biotechnology. Um, but again, that's the motherhood and apple pie thing. Um, you can't possibly be against that. So how, is it, how does one forge or promote that agenda of policies? How does one create conditions for social ownership, um, identify what real social need is? How can one promote decentralized democratic planning on the basis of increased knowledge of the participants in the planning process. So decisions are made about allocation and distribution of resources that are not only democratic, but they're socially equitable. And that's what we, I think generally we could, if we had to sign a declaration at the end of today, I hope that's some of the things that we could sign off on, but what would it mean and how do we get there? What are the political forces that create the conditions for delivering that. Is it possible, and well, I mean, and okay, then I'll go further. It's not rocket science, is it? You either have a strong state, politically convened and conformed to deliver this socialist agenda, or in the context of either crumbling or fragile neoliberal states, which are varying in their levels of authoritarianism and secrecy and lack of transparency, try and create pockets and opportunities that won't become military free zones, as in the liberation movements in the 70s, but will create conditions for trying to pr promote food sovereignty on the ground, amongst and within and between communities. So, you know, Carol knows farmers in, in the Jordan Valley, Habib knows farmers in Tunisia, uh, we know farmers who um, create conditions for their own food sovereignty, their own seed sovereignty. This is clearly illustrative of the kind of incremental um, push that farmers themselves are pushing back on in relation to what they recognize to be the deleterious consequences of being participants in a in the neoliberal market that they understand is screwing them that's 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 well known but we don't what are the alternatives we have a strong state that can deliver it there isn't one existing on the planet incremental political movements to try and create the conditions for promoting it yes there are those movements present but they're not delivering on large scale. So actually, one of the questions would be, if, this is the, if, if we can agree an agenda, how can we precisely scale up the knowledge that we have of food sovereignty activists in the countryside to become much more meaningful and deliverable that would spread and manage to compete more? Well, no, I don't want to use that word compete, because if I say to compete more equally with the marketeers and the biotech companies, then that's to concede the ground, isn't it? It has to be a learning process of delivering outcomes which are more beneficial to farmers than those that they're currently experiencing. <laughs> Create conditions for policy and policy, trans policy delivery that enables farmers' lives to be improved 
in a way that is um, a, a better form of improvement or return to farm labor than that which is currently in place under neoliberalism. In other words, how do we create conditions for rewarding labor and the creation and promotion of social need, public goods, rather than simply those that are driven through the market? Because that's the defining character. For me, that would be the, the cleavage around the market economy for the market and exchange value, rather than public goods for use value to meet needs on a democratic basis. That's socialism, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? Can I ask a question, a very brief question of clarification, because you made a point, but it was made so fast, I couldn't quite get it. And that is, you referred to a poverty line, which gave some 2.1% of population in poverty. Now, uh, which country or region was this referring to? It was the Middle East. The Middle East. Sorry? Sorry. It was, the, it was the Middle East and North Africa. Middle East, East and North, North Africa. Africa. And the poverty line the World Bank was using was $1.90. $1.90, yes. right. And that was actually in the 2017 World Bank report. So it's quite a current figure. Now, that, that figure of $1.90, okay. co yes, contrasts okay. to per head. That contrasts with somebody like um, uh, Nada what? Fagani. Sorry, Nada Fagani. What? Sorry, just... what do they use for uh, Europe or Britain, for example? They, they didn't. They just, they just, they don't. They, they don't. They just say Europe. They, they themselves say Europe. Okay. I mean, so, there's no so, poverty line for Europe or for the US. There must be, because well, there's there social is. security. There are. There are poverty lines, but they're not. It's in relation to national minimum wage, not in relation to, um, in, not in relation to uh, a daily allowance. But the point is that, that Nada Fagani, for example, an uh, economist in Egypt who was the lead author on the UN's Human Development Report, um, argued that whilst the bank and the government of Egypt were talking about these kinds of figures for, 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 for poverty, he argued that actually more than 80% of rural Egyptians were living on less than $2 a day. More than 80%. So, I mean, the, the um, contrast between the figures is, is extraordinary. And that's partly because in Egypt, so CAPMAS, the, the Institute for Organizing Data Collection has been run by the military. For sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, this 80% Below this level yeah. is a figure given by who? By a lead author in the UN Development Report, oh, Nada Fagani. UNDP, who, yeah, okay. Who's an Egyptian And the economist. World Bank estimate is 2% in poverty. 1.9%. Yeah, yes, one, no. 1.9 dollars? Yes, yeah, 1.9 dollars, 2.3%. That's my last word on it. <laughs> We'll discuss this but later I can give, on. I can give you these exact figures. Mm. I will give you these. No, exact. because it's, it's sort of complicated. I've been working on Indian poverty figures for a very long time, for more yeah. than 10 years. Yeah. And the whole thing is, with this poverty line, is that you see what they do is uh, they actually take a base here, which is very far back in the past. And then uh, the poverty line is derived uh, for the base here quite correctly as the amount that will allow you to satisfy a nutritional norm, but then they don't apply the same definition later on. What they do is simply update that poverty line by a price index. So you, in the case of, yeah, they don't apply the same definition, the definition gets changed. So that's why in India what we find is that the official poverty line is giving you lower and lower proportion of people in poverty because it's not a proper nutrition-based poverty line anymore. It's simply a price indexation of a poverty line which was arrived at 40 years ago, in 1973, okay? And if I, I have, we have very good database in India. So yeah. when I look at the National Sample <clears throat> Survey figures from which uh, they do their estimation, if I look at the nutrition figures, mm -hmm. and then I relate the two and apply the original definition, I find that 75 to 80 percent of the rural population is in poverty. That's the correct definition, applying the nutrition norm. So that's why I was interested in this divergence you're talking about. It's a statistical trick, is, yes. which the World Bank has been doing, yeah. and which every national government has been doing. 
For years and years, they've been taking us for a ride, saying poverty is declining, when actually it's increasing. It's not declining, if you measure it properly. Thank you. Uh, requesting again uh, a, a response, which is actually where do you situate Arab uprising in the third food regime and uh, where do you situate populism that is uh, rising also in the third food regime, like Trump, election, Orban, uh, <coughs> Italy, what's happening, etc. Well, I mean, I'm to take a certain distance from the slinging around of the term populism, but. Um, mm. I'm not, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how I would answer the, one, the question in relation to um, Trump and populism. I think the, 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 the easier question in relation to um, the uprisings in Egypt and Tunisia is to see a direct link between the um, levels of uh, rural impoverishment and the increase in um, political activism and ultimately the mobilization that toppled the two dictatorships. But at the same time, it's, I wouldn't over-egg that, um, if I can use that terrible English saying, I wouldn't um, overstress um, food and bread riots um, as the, anything other than perhaps the immediate um, spark that creates the conditions for mass mobilization and the toppling of the regime. I think in both the case, and this is something that Habib has documented very well in Tunisia, but I've also looked at in relation to Egypt, one sees the uh, groundswell of the uprising in Egypt from um, before 2004 and Asif Nazif coming to power as the new neoliberalizing prime minister with, with Mubarak, and before that the massive mobilization in Mahalla of textile workers, so there's a tremendous drive from organized working class. Mahalla, people don't often understand, is the greatest, is a town of the greatest concentration of industrial workers of anywhere in the Middle East. And those workers for more than a decade had been a pain in the side of the authoritarian regime. Um, interestingly, there is a recent report, which I didn't refer to here, but it runs alongside an analysis I've done also of the, of the, the bank, which I did mention. There's an, there's an interesting report by the Brookings Institute um, looking at um, Middle East poverty. And they are much more concerned that persistent poverty in the contemporary period will create conditions for another uprising. This is from Brookings. <laughs> and, that, and that's um, both in Tunisia and in, in Egypt. So there is a clear, there's a clear link, but I would want to see a longer, a view of long durée on the background and the conditions which create the transformation of both Tunisia and Egypt, rather than just simply the deaths in the bread queues in Egypt two years before the uprising. Any, any political regime you would think would have enough attention to understand that this is something's going wrong, <laughs> but it didn't, and it intensified repression rather than creating the conditions for releasing it. Yes, I'm going to give a last word to Habib, but then I, before that I want to remind us, of course, that both Syria and Yemen had perhaps the biggest mobilizations of all, and it, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, by the scale of the population and by the durée of uh, its holding up, <coughs> and we, we simply don't incorporate that sufficiently into our understanding of the uprising, so to speak. Habib. Just very short. Uh, yeah, this one. Yeah, a very short uh, comment, answer. <laughs> uh, the, the social explosion in Sidi Bouzid and the start of the revolution, considering the short uh, time, okay, because the things are, were, much longer, but let's say that, uh, th let's consider this short period of November, uh, Dece December uh, 2010, January 2011. It was in Sidi Bouzid, okay? And it was about access to land, to agricultural resources, to natural resources, and to bread. 
the, the first slogan in Sidi Bouzid after the suicide of uh, Muhammad Bazizi was bread and dignity. Because Muhammad Bazizi was killed. Okay? He, do, he didn't kill him, himself. Physically, yes, he did. But in the process killed him. And the process is it was a process of limitation of access to food through limitation of access to nat natural resources. This, this the, the immediate connection, relationship between food, uh, production and access both, and the, what happened uh, later in the, in the region. حضور خاصة على سمود سمود الحضور في اليوم الطويل وأشكر كذلك كل المداخلات وكل من وجه لنا تحليلاته. And Uta, I would like to thank you for setting off such a long day and having the fantastic stamina to be asking the last series of questions too. So now I think we go. To to have a bite to eat, mostly. Everyone? At seven. At, off at seven? Okay. <laughs>